Let's get to it. And China's government stimulus measures have not only boosted property values, stocks, and also infrastructure spending, but the once moribund automobile industry as well. And Bloomberg Stephen Angle joins us from Beijing with more details. So Steve, what's cleaning off the mothballs for this industry? <laughs> A lot of pent-up demand, and of course, there's been a lot of price co competition in the market, and the the auto sales have really, or the automobiles have really been rolling off the uh, showroom floors here. Uh, auto stocks, uh, let's look at those as well, because they've benefited. Uh, stocks in China and Hong Kong have rocketed this year, some more than tripling on those uh, increased sales that we've seen in the first half, and also the outlook for the mainland car market. Uh, take a look at some of these. Uh, these are the A and B shares. Uh, actually, most of them are A shares, just the Chang'an automobile at the bottom is a B share. SAIC, Shanghai Automotive, uh, which has tie-ups with both General Motors and Volkswagen, have surged more than 250 percent this year. Uh, similar gains across the board for other mainland listed car makers, as you can see. We can flip the page to see the car makers that are listed in Hong Kong. Shares of China's third largest automaker, Dongfeng Auto, have more than tripled as well, as have the smaller upstarts like Geely and also BYD. BYD is a battery maker. It began selling electric cars in China last year. Uh, China's passenger vehicle sales rising 48 percent in June, the biggest jump since February 2006. Again, a lot of pent-up demand. The government's $585 billion economic stimulus package has helped China surpass the U.S. as the world's largest auto market this year. Uh, the government acted to boost auto demand after sales fell in five of the six months ending in January. Foreign players have been benefiting as well, of course, General Motors really relies on China right now, boosted first half sales 38 percent. Volkswagen deliveries rising to a record in the first half, up 11 percent. Hyundai Motor of South Korea sales jumping 56 percent. A lot of the Beijing taxis are Hyundais. And uh, Toyota's first half sales, they were flat year over year in the first half, but June sales jumped 33 percent. And uh, yet domestic car makers, Susan, have struggled to turn this surging demand into higher profits because of rising competition. There's been a lot of sticker competition here. Uh, combined profit at the country's top 19 automakers falling 10 percent in the first five months, while revenue declined 2.3 percent. So more cars are coming onto the roads. Not a good thing if you've ever been stuck in Beijing traffic. But uh, that needs to translate into higher profitability at the car makers. Perhaps our next guest can shed some light on that. Yeah, Beijing traffic is uh, quite a nightmare. Didn't you like it during the Olympics when they, uh, I guess, they mixed the uh, <laughs> positive, Much the better. odd numbers, and also the uh, uh, the uh, the odd numbers as well? The plates changed every month, so we had less uh, cars. They're still the doing road, that, though. You're right. Oh, that's good. You're benefiting from it. And you mentioned yeah. how Beijing taxis are now Hyundai's. Remember the days of this little Shalis? That was a, a different world back then, <laughs> just about three years ago. So let's uh, bring in the number yeah. one ranked analyst on our Bloomberg system on uh, China's Denway Motors, as we've been promising. Zhou Wenho is the uh, head of Asian Auto Research at Citigroup, and his recommendations on Denway, also Dongfang Motor, have generated 12-month returns of as much as 200 percent. It's good to see you once again, Joe. And so let's uh, first talk about those uh, those huge passenger car sales numbers that we're seeing on the mainland, up 48 percent, as uh, Steve was mentioning. But everyone's asking, this is based on sub subsidies, tax rebates. Can this pace of sales continue, or is this all about artificial demand right now? I think the car sales growth this year has been a pleasant surprise to everyone. Um, the key is that, at least heading into the second half of this year, we're working off a relatively low base in the second half of 08. So from a year uh, over year perspective, we should still see some very strong growth numbers going into second half of 2009. And what about, uh, you're talking about Chinese car makers, but uh, you cover all of Asia, but how do Chinese car makers stack up against its uh, rivals in, say, Japan, which are the world's biggest now, and also in South Korea as well, with the Hyundai and Kia doing pretty well on the week one? I think the key to remember is that the Chinese car market is still very much a domestically focused market. So the business models for most of the companies that are listed in Hong Kong is mainly focused on the domestic uh, Chinese car market versus the Koreans and the Japanese, which uh, has much more export orientation and sales to de developed markets in the world, such as Europe and the U.S. 
Hey, Jerwin, Steve Angle up here. Let's break down some of your individual picks. You like Denway. I didn't, it didn't make my list of uh, stocks there because it's one of the, uh, the laggards, if you will. It's up only 70% year to date in <laughs> Hong Kong. Stock code 203. They make Hondas and also Toyotas uh, down in Guangzhou. I'm just looking at some of the breakdown, and, and I want to get from you if this is the overall trend in the industry. The Accords, the higher leader, bigger engine cars, the the growth rate there is, is smaller, 9% year over year for the Accord. The MPV, which is the minivan, are, uh, is up or down 21%. But the fit in the city, the small engine cars, higher by 34% year over year. Is this the overall trend in the China market? Smaller cars, smaller engines? Yeah, that's been a very clear trend we've seen so far in the first half of 09 in terms of car sales. Uh, obviously, it's reflecting where the tax cut has come through, which is for passenger vehicles 1.6 liter and below. However, we would say that from May onwards, we're starting to see a renaissance, a recovery in the larger engine size car sales on a year-over-year -year basis. So that's an encouraging trend heading into second half of this year. Uh, in addition to unit sales growth, we could also get some better product mix. And Ger uh, Jerwin, what do you like about Denway and Dongfeng, the two of your picks? Uh, they make Japanese cars. Is that part of the, the reason, or is it valuations? I think for both companies, uh, you know, in addition to what's happening this year, uh, throughout their history and going forward, they have very competitive uh, models in China, uh, which makes them not just a good stock for 2009, but also for, you know, for foreseeable future. And for Dongfeng, uh, one thing that has happened this year is that uh, Beijing has basically named it as one of the eight consolidators for China's auto industry uh, going forward. Okay, well, we'll talk about consolidation later on, but I'm looking at uh, Denway's valuations and it's trading at $4.04 here in Hong Kong. That's already trading above your price target, which mm -hmm. was uh, about three eighty-five. dollars uh, Where do you think the stock is going to trade? It's already exceeded what you thought it was going to reach. Uh, maybe you should rethink your target price, possibly? I think from a Unicell standpoint, uh, we are slightly below the company's target for this year. And recently, they've also uh, talked about the unit sales possibly being higher than their current unit sales target. Also, I think one key change is the improvement in product mix, possibly in the second half of this year. Mm -hmm. And this is where then we can benefit more because it has bigger, more exposure in the uh, larger engine size cars in China. Jerwin, which uh, stocks do you not like? I, I, I'm seeing a list of them. It looks like you don't like the heavy machinery or the trucks. Uh, the axle makers and things like that. What, what is it about the heavy industry vehicle sector that you don't like? I think uh, within our, you know, the, the stocks we don't like right now, the, the one stock uh, that I think you could be talking about is Sana Truck, and it's more of a valuation issue. Uh, I think even in the second half of 2009, we're going to see a pretty good recovery in the heavy duty truck market. Uh, within the heavy duty truck space, we do prefer Wei Chai over Sana Truck on a valuation basis. It's a cheaper way to get exposure to recovering heavy-duty truck market in China. Yeah, Jer, when you men mentioned Sino Truck, you say sell this stock. What about Tingling? It's also, a, it has a bit of a, a foothold in the, in the truck market as well. So you're saying sell this stock. Is that also on a valuation basis? Uh, yes, the valuation for, for Tingling on a PE basis is even substantially higher than Sino Truck right now. Uh, Tingling is more of a light truck maker. It's a different end market. The concern for what we have for Qingling is more on the profitability basis. They cut the prices of some of the key models this year. Okay. Well, Jerwin, we have to go to a commercial right now. Stay where you are. After this break, we'll have more with Jerwin on the uh, Chinese auto market. And it was uh, four years ago today when China responded to its critics by letting its currency rise. More thoughts on the yuan after this break. Stay with us here on The Edge. And welcome back to the Bloomberg Edge. U.S. airlines may join the bailout parade. First it was banks, then car makers, and now J.P. Morgan Chase says that Washington may prove to be the lender of last resort for airlines as well. The bank says that three of the industry's biggest companies have to raise money in order to plug losses, and there may be a lack of capital outside of the government. They are AMR, which owns American Airlines, UAL, which runs United Airlines, and also U.S. Airways. And this chart, 
it. Let's bring up the chart. Shows the five-year credit default swaps on both American Airlines and also UAL, and they've been surging since May. CDSs are uh, what investors buy to protect against or speculate on bond defaults of any troubled companies. JP Morgan says that UAL and also U.S. Airways may restart merger talks after breaking off a year ago, and it may be a shotgun marriage this time to avoid bankruptcy. The bank has underweight on these two airlines. Uh, JP Morgan has an overweight on AMR because Americans' parents has more avenues to seek funds. Now let's get back to our discussion on uh, Chinese auto stocks. And we have the number one rated analyst on China's Denway Motors, which happens to be a stock that uh, emerging markets guru Mark Mobius also buys into. Jiren Ho rejoins us. So Jiren, let's uh, pick up now on the discussion of Dongfang Motors, which is China's uh, third biggest consolidated automaker. And uh, shares have uh, really skyrocketed, tripled this year so far. It's also exceeding your target price as well. Let me just first ask you, uh, are you going to revise a target price higher? Uh, we obviously we always, always have to keep in touch with the fundamentals to see where the stocks are going. I think one reason why the stock has been strong is that it's been able to grow faster in the car market this year in the first half in terms of unit sales. Uh, as we also said this year uh, in March, uh, Beijing has named Dongfeng as one of the eight consolidators in the auto industry and that gives a special status and long-term visibility as a player in the auto market, which I think investors care about. And what does that consolidator status give you? What, what do you see that seem, seems to make it more transparent? Uh, I think at least we have visibility on Dongfeng's longer-term future in the market. As we all know, the car market uh, in China is very fragmented, and to be on you know one of the players on the eight, eight you know one of the eight players on the list does give you more visibility and perhaps more implicit support from the government in terms of developments going forward. Yeah, you mentioned Denway is also one of those uh, consolidators as well, named as a consolidator. Denway's parent, Guangzhou Auto, is mm -hmm. also one of the eight. So it's a subsidiary of a consolidator. Yeah, so again, there's more visibility, which makes the stock more attractive. More, more attractive, more security or i.e. lower risk. Okay, well, what about Dongfang? Because as we mentioned, it, it's had a huge surge so far this year, but still trades below the valuations of its global peers. Does it uh, actually deserve that? And how much upside do you see on this stock? Uh, I, I think the stock is it's the biggest market cap stock uh, listed in Hong Kong. As you said, it's the third largest automaker. Uh, and I think it's going to be a function of the growth of the China market, especially into 1.0, and how it could be growing relative to the market, which has traditionally has been growing at a slightly higher growth rate. Now, it's interesting. We're looking at the estimated P.E. of Dongfang Motors at 11.2. And you say P.E. is really the best valuation tool in order to judge, uh, I guess, the target prices and, and what these car stocks in China are worth. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned that maybe you don't have a price to book? You don't have a, maybe, you know, EBITDA to work off of? Isn't there some sort of lack of transparency on these stocks? And is it worth buying into with that sort of risk? I, I think it's part of, you know, part of the structure of the accounting and the reporting standard for these companies. So, so Dongfeng is consolidated, consolidated accounting. Uh, there are lim some lim limitations, but, you know, th that's what we have to work with. And I think the PE is the most, at least across the stocks within the China Auto Universe, the one most common denominator that people can look at to evaluate these stocks. An, an accurate tool in your, in your I guess, uh, in your eyes. Uh, so, so far, it's worked out. So far, okay. <laughs> Good luck for the future. But let me just ask you about, uh, interestingly enough, there's an interesting point on, the, on Denway and also Dongfeng in, in that some of them don't actually have A-share listings. Mm -hmm. they, don't, mm -hmm. they don't sell on the mainland. Do you mm -hmm. think... You know, we're hearing about the uh, the pickup in the IPO market once again mm -hmm. in Shanghai. Do you think it's a possibility that we may see one of these auto stocks and these auto companies list uh, in Shanghai or Shenzhen? Uh, I, I think this is up to the regulators. Obviously, there's a lot of other industries, not just the auto industry, that, that need to raise funds in the Asian market. Uh, there's quite a big universe of Asia-listed auto stocks already. Uh, it's something that's possible, but it's not something that we focus on right now. Okay, Jerwin, say where you are. Let's talk about uh, the ADRs and, and the shares of these uh, Chinese auto companies that are traded in the U.S. Uh, after this. But right now, let's go on and talk about uh, the uh, Forex markets. And Trisha is standing by in Singapore. And Trisha, it's a, a big anniversary for China today because uh, just four years ago, the country revalued its currency, the yuan. And uh, since then, the yuan has gained over 21%. So, Trisha... What does today mean? What's the significance? 
Well, Susan, it's funny that uh, a, a viewer actually pointed out the significance of it was that uh, the fourth anniversary today is actually taking place on the eve of what will be the longest solar eclipse uh, across China in a century. So maybe there's a bit of significance there. But like you say, the yuan has indeed made a lot of progress in the last uh, four years. Uh, but actually, the bulk of the progress was made in the last three years. It's grown about 21 or percent. And over this period of four years, we saw a lot more uh, fine-tuning of the mechanism as well. Uh, we saw that the yuan was increasingly more convertible, especially in its current account. We saw uh, foreign investors, um, you know, able to, to invest, uh, move money more easily within and in, inside and outside of China. And we also see the same thing happening for Chinese exporters and, uh, you know, foreigners trading with China are able to keep the yuan as well in some offshore accounts as well. We see a lot of those developments happening, especially in Hong Kong. Kong. And we also see that, uh, and especially in the last one year, uh, there were a lot more uh, uh, agreements uh, between China um, and other countries, especially in the last few months with uh, Brazil, with Russia, uh, in using the yuan uh, as, a, as a settlement currency. Uh, and of course, you know, we, we did have the, um, you know, the, the yuan did, uh, appreciation that stall um, against the dollar in the past year. It stuck at uh, 6.8 uh, to the U.S. dollar, and but it's mostly because of um, uh, the global uh, economic crisis uh, and, of course, uh, you know, China's trade collapse and there was a lot of pressure on Beijing to stall the yuan appreciation. Susan? Okay, well, Trish, quickly, let me just ask you, in the four years since, there's been a lot of rhetoric, especially from the U.S., about more appreciation for the yuan, but it seems to have died down in recent months. Yes, and traders are expecting that uh, any further political rhetoric uh, out of uh, uh, Washington will uh, be very uh, weak uh, at best, uh, simply because uh, markets, markets realize that China's uh, bargain in power has, increasing, has risen uh, simply because of uh, the Washington needs mm -hmm. of China to continue to buy the U.S. debt. Okay. Uh, that's why uh, they expect that uh, any uh, pressure on China okay. to actually appreciate its, its currency All right, will be Trish, quite uh, uh, watered.